Good morning, church. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Worship team, thank you guys so much. Uh, if you are uh, new to the church or perhaps are uh, just getting connected, my name's Michael. I have the privilege of pastoring the church here, and you came on a super fun week because we are in the middle of a series called The Apocalypse. Have you all been enjoying it so far? I know it's been, uh, I've been enjoying it, if nobody else. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's been um, a really fun series for us. What we've been doing is we've been going through the book of Revelation, which is a highly debated book. It is a book where people have strong opinions or they just don't want to read it because they're a little bit scared of it. And we've just been going through this chapter by chapter. Uh, so thus far, we are five weeks in and we have gone through five chapters. And if somebody could cut the lights on, that would be awesome so I can see pretty faces. So we're five weeks in, we've done five chapters, and today we're going to do 12 chapters. See y'all ready? We're, we're, we're going to have fun today, like we have to catch up on some things, and these 12 chapters are the most debated chapters throughout the book of Revelation. Like people agree at the beginning, people agree at the end, but in the middle, people get all these crazy ideas of what they think should happen or they think shouldn't happen. And so I figure let's just go to crazy town all at once and hit all 12 chapters right now. Uh, so I want you to picture yourself in a doctor's appointment. You're, you're, you're there, the doctor is giving you a diagnosis. It's not a good one. And he says, hey, this is your diagnosis. Don't worry. We'll give you treatment and you'll be all right. Have a nice day. Now, for some of you, you'd be like, oh, cool, this is great. I have no issues with this. I can be totally fine. How many of you are a little bit type A and want to know all the details of what that doctor is going to do? Like for me, I want to know the entire plan. I want to know the side effects. I want to know every single part of it. I had this kind of problem of being a little bit of a control freak about things. Uh, my oldest son, he went and touch the one thing you're not supposed to touch in the house, he adjusted the thermostat the other day. And not only did he like touch it, some of y'all felt that very personally. <laughs> he didn't just touch it, he turned it off. Wow. I, right, exactly, that was my thought right there. I'm thinking, you must be more related to your mother because that's unacceptable right there. And, and like he turned it off and when I turned it back on it had gotten up to 84 degrees upstairs. Man, I'd always wondered why they have those keypad thermostats. Now I know somebody loves Jesus and made that. So if you want to give me a gift because it's Sunday, that's exactly what I need in my life. But, but like, I, I want to know the details of things. I want to know how things flow. And in the book of Revelation, there is a, a diagnosis. It's found in Revelation and it's found in the rest of the Bible. There's a diagnosis of sin in the world. There's a diagnosis of death in the world. It's just the reality of the planet we live on. And there is a diagnosis, but there's also a solution to it. And the solution to every single part of the destruction of this earth is Jesus. Like he is the solution to all of these things. And for some people, you're like, great, Jesus, that's enough. That's all I need. Others of you are going, all right, I know Jesus is the answer, but... What are some of the side effects that happen with Jesus? You realize there are side effects for loving Jesus, like, like persecution. Like that's something that we are promised we're going to have to face in our life. If you don't love Jesus, you do not have to face that kind of persecution. If you do, you have the side effect of persecution in your life. If you love Jesus, you have the side effect of having to say no to fleshly desires and say yes to spiritual calling. Like there are some side effects because you love Jesus. And for some people, they are going to face extreme side effects if they live through this thing called the tribulation. And that's what these 12 chapters are going to be on. And I'm not going to focus heavily on the timeline. Everybody wants to know the timeline. When's it going to start? When's it going to end? How do all these things work? And I, I will give you my thoughts on it, but I, I, I don't think that God really intended us to fully understand the timeline because if Jesus wanted us to know that, he would have just wrote it down. He would have been like, in the year 2097, that's when it's going to happen. He would have told us if he wanted us to know that. There's a reason why he didn't want us to know the exact hour and day. And in fact, he says, no man knows the exact hour. And so I'll give you some of my thoughts on it, but I'm not going to go all the way into that because I don't think that's the point of it. 
If, if you're new to the subject of the tribulation, let me, let me give you an overview of it before we dive into it. There is going to be a seven-year period at the end of earth. And there's a couple ways that you can try to figure out how this thing works, but there's, there's seven years and there's going to be a rapture at some point during this. And, and rapture is when it literally means to be caught up in the air where, where the, the, the Old Testament saints that, that have died, those who are dead in Christ and those who are alive in Christ, as in people who love Jesus that are both dead and alive, are going to be caught up into the air with Jesus. And there's a lot of questions I have about that. Like, what do you do with prosthetic limbs with that? Or like, what do you do if you have nails in or screws in your knee or like artificial teeth? Like, is there going to be a pile that grandma left behind? I have no idea. But there's going to be a moment where you are raptured up into heaven if you are alive during that time. And it's going to happen most likely at one of three different times. So you have the tribulation. It's that seven-year period. There is a pre-tribulation rapture, which means before those seven years happen, people will be raptured up to be with Jesus. That's one viewpoint. Another one is post-tribulation rapture, which is where the seven years happen, and then afterwards the rapture takes place. And then the final one is a mid-tribulation rapture, which means three and a half years rapture, three and a half years. Those are the main three viewpoints. It won't be all three. It'll only be one of them. But we know that the rapture is going to take place at some point, and I'm just going to let you know I'm not all that concerned about when it's going to happen. It's just not a big deal to me, because like if it's a pre-trib rapture, like I just go up to heaven and get to watch, like that's going to be all right. If it's a post-tribulation or a mid-tribulation, like that's going to be tough, three and a half years of just awfulness, but then I'm going to be with Jesus, and it's going to be all right. And if it's a seven-year period, and then I'm raptured, like that's, that's really going to be tough, and I might die for my faith during that period of time. But even if I do die for my faith and I'm martyred for believing in Jesus, I'm going to be all right. And so I don't want to spend all of my time trying to figure that out because at the end, Jesus wins and I get to spend forever with him. But for those of you that are curious and for those of you that want to read the whole Bible, which hopefully is all of us, I do want to go through this. So we got 21 items we're going to talk about this morning. Get your seatbelts on. Buckle up. Y'all ready for this? Here we go. We're going to talk about the seven seals to start. I'm not talking like seals that make weird water noises. That's not the kind of seals we're talking about. Some of y'all were thinking there was like aquatic animals in Revelation. There are, but this is not it. Uh, and the number is seven for this. And you remember seven is trending throughout this book. Like we already talked about the seven letters to the seven churches that were distributed by the seven angels. We're going to talk about seven seals, seven bowls, seven tr uh, trumpets. We're going to talk about the seven different characters that show up. Seven is woven throughout it. Here are the seven seals. Let's start in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. It says, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So this first one is actually the Antichrist who's showing up on the scene. An aggressor would be another word for it. When this whole seven-year process starts, it begins with the physical manifestation of the Antichrist being present. And he's on a horse that's colored white. It does not mean that there's literally a white horse riding through the nations. It's, it's figurative right here. And we're going to see that several other horses are going to show up within these first couple verses. But we got the first one that is the Antichrist showing up. That is the first seal. In verse 3, it says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. So, so another horse shows up, red this time, and, and great warfare begins to go throughout the planet. And so we have the Antichrist on the scene. Wars are starting. Verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard the living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be like a voice in the midst of the four creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, 
and do not harm the oil and wine. So this third one, it's a horse, and again, it's figurative, but there's famine that's beginning to go throughout the lands. There's a denarius, which is roughly a day's wage, so say 50, 100 bucks, whatever your, your take-home is, $200 if you're really doing all right, and this one day's wage would be used to be able to buy some bread. We're talking really, really tough income taking place, really high cost of living. It says the oil and the wine won't be harmed because the rich will be doing all right. So for the average folk, it's going to be hard to live off of a working wage. Now, you're probably thinking already, man, I see wars present. All you got to do is look over in Ukraine. It's horrendous what's happening over there. We already see inflation taking place. This is really, really difficult. I already see this happening. You're going to notice as we go through all of these different seals, trumpets, and bowls, that there's hints of these things already present. But that does not mean we are in these seven years. Because if you've studied any of this apocalyptic history, people are going, man, we got a new president in, and I don't like what he's doing. This must be the end of the world. Well, it wasn't, but I promise this time it's going to be the end of the world. Did you see the blood moon? Can I just be real? Blood moons happen all the time. Like All the time I see, this is the last blood moon you'll ever see in your life. And I'm like, you're a liar. That's not true. People take these moments and they try to sensationalize them and make it seem like the end of the world's happening. And we see little hints of this already taking place, but that does not mean we're there yet. But what it also means is if you think it's bad right now, unfortunately, it's, it's going to get worse in time when we hit that seven-year period. Now we have the fourth horse. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked... And behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And there was given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. So there are four seals that have been opened, and there's four horses that are represented here. And you've probably heard the four horsemen before as as, as an idea. Like that's, that comes from this right here. There's already these seals beginning to open, and it's starting to create havoc on earth. So we're four in. There's seven seals all together. Let's hit the last three of them. Verse nine through 11. And when he opened the fifth seal... I saw the altar of the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So you have people that were proclaiming Jesus that were killed for that. They're able to hear their voices at this moment. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So the the fifth seal is we're going to start to see more people dying for their faith. And if you think that Christian martyrdom, which martyrdom is dying for your faith, if you think that Christian martyrdom was only present in the Bible, you need to kind of wake up and look around the globe. There are people that are dying for their faith today. We're just a little bit more comfy here in our country of the United States. But we're going to see more people dying for their faith. The sixth seal, when he opened up the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So we're having devastating earthquakes, issues with the sun, the moon, mountains, and islands. And then you have the seventh one, and it says this in Revelation 8.1, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And so... Right now, we've made it to the first seven of these, and we're starting to get a glimpse of things that are going to happen during this seven-year period, or perhaps during this three-and-a-half-year period, depending on how you view the book of Revelation. But these are things that should raise awareness. And these are things also that shouldn't seem too extreme, because as the world continues on, it gets closer and closer to this moment, and we're getting closer and closer to our reality becoming like this. Let's go on to the uh, trumpets now. 
you all ever uh, look out over the clouds and you uh, see a dark st uh, storm cloud that's coming your way? And you're thinking, okay, that's heading my direction. Uh, maybe it's a hurricane, maybe it's something else, and you start to see it coming, and then you might even get little spurts of rain, but the full storm hasn't come. That's the same idea with this. Like, there is a storm that is coming our way. It is going to be a storm that, that literally wipes out the planet, and we can see it coming, but it does not mean that it's necessarily here yet. I, I personally don't believe we're in that seven-year period right now, but I think we're a lot closer than we used to be. Uh, the seven trumpets. Verse 6 of chapter 8. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. And so there are seven angels that literally have trumpets and they're getting ready to sound these things off. The first seven items that happened were because of things that were happening from a, a human perspective, people that were doing things in the world. These, these, these four horsemen that are wreaking havoc throughout our world, these next ones are going to be ones that are caused uh, outside of human control. Let's go to the first one. Verse seven, the first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. Which when I read this the first time, we're going back 20 years or so, I was thinking like, like how is that even possible? How would that much of the earth just burn up? How many of you have seen the alarming images of fires happening all across our world? And you look at those videos and it, it literally, it looks like hell right before you. And we're getting a glimpse again of how these things could begin to start taking form. The second one in verse eight through nine, the second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. There's gonna be death of much of the aquatic world. And there have been reports before where there've been massive casualties that were found in the water and the water literally turned red because of it. It's just gonna happen on a larger scale. So like if you like to fish like me, you might wanna knock that out before this second trumpet gets blown because it's gonna be really, really tough to be able to do that. It goes on for the third one in verse 10, the angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. There's a lot of people that could try to interpret what that is or what that isn't. I'm not gonna try to make assumptions on that. I just know that it's gonna take place. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. So now you have a problem with water found throughout the globe. A third of the people having issues because of it. In verse 12, we get to the fourth trumpet. The fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light may be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining. Likewise, a third of the night. So there is a darkening that happens all across the globe that people had not seen before. In chapter nine, verse one through four, the fifth angel blew his trumpet and saw a star had fallen from earth and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. A couple of really interesting things that are happening here. One, we're seeing this massive opening happen, smoke's coming up, locusts, and you could try to interpret what they are or what they aren't, but the part that stuck out to me is there's people that are gonna have a seal of God on their foreheads, those who are believers, and there's gonna be others who don't have that seal. And if you have that seal, you're protected from this fifth trumpet. But if you don't have that seal, there is literally going to be demonic torture that happens to those who are unbelievers. 
happening as the fifth one. Number six, then the sixth angel blew his trumpet and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the gate at, at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. So now there is a literally a third of the population instantly wiped out instantly wiped out. And if you're living during this time, you're probably starting to realize that something unusual is taking place. And that's the whole point of this. There's people that are mash casualties that are taking place. And then we move into the final one. The seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and shall reign forever and ever. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, uh, pails of thunder and earthquakes and heavy hail. And so the earth has this massive eruption that takes place. Now, if you're reading this, you're probably starting to get desensitized a little bit. Because this is what happens when you like, get a bad event. You're like, that's really frustrating. I hope that never happens again. When two happen, you're like, this is getting bad. But by the time that you're 14 things in, like we are right now through reading this, you're just desensitized to all the things that are happening. And the people who are alive during this time, they're going to get warning after warning after warning that they need to bow to Jesus, but their hearts have been hardened. And even though God is making it very clear they can still accept him, they're choosing to reject God. Let's get into the final seven right now. Actually, now let me get to the performers. So there's a little break. So you have the seven uh, seals that happen and then you have the seven trumpets and then we have a little bit of a, a break that happens where seven characters begin to show up in chapters 12 and 13. First, you have the woman and she represents Israel. And then you have the red dragon who represents Satan. And then you have the child of the woman who represents Jesus Christ. So these three characters are found in this image that John is seeing and the dragon is trying to take out Jesus. But right before he's able to, Michael the angel shows up as the fourth person. The dragon tries to do things, but he can't because, the, because Michael's there. Then you see a remnant of the people of Israel, the local church today. And finally, the wild beast of the sea, who's going to be somebody of political power, and the wild beast of the earth, who's going to be a religious leader, come onto the scene. So now you have all of these things that are present leading up to this final moment that's about to happen. All of creation has led up to this battle of Armageddon that's getting ready to take place. And then there's great application with it, if you, can, if you can stick with me for these seven bowls. So Revelation 16 now says this, I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of wrath of God. Now, when you hear the wrath of God in modern church, Oftentimes it's rejected because when I hear of Jesus, I think of Jesus, the loving King. I think of Jesus, the one who gave his life for me. I think of Jesus, the one who's quick to forgive. I think of Jesus, who's the one who told those that were going to stone the lady to get out. I think of Jesus as almost like this cuddly person. And in reality, Jesus is, is he fully kind? Absolutely. But Jesus knows how to draw a line in the sand and knows how to call a spade a spade. And Jesus is somebody who is, yes, fair, but he's also just. Jesus is somebody who's going to stick up for the right things. And so when the wrath of God comes, it's not because God is mean. It's because people have rejected him over and over again. Have you heard this phrase before? Jesus is the, the lion and the lamb. And if you've seen pictures of it, you probably see Jesus as this lion, as this ferocious animal. And then you see on the other side, like Jesus holding this cute, cuddly little lamb. Have anybody ever seen that picture before? It's absolutely ridiculous and not found anywhere in the Bible. Lion and lamb is, but lamb is probably better interpreted as a ram. Now, if you were in a little fence, uh, fenced off area and there was a ram charging you, you probably aren't thinking of Jesus stroking a cute little lamb. Jesus is somebody who has full power and is able to get things done. And we're going to see that start to manifest itself 
And I'm so thankful that we're on the right team for this. So the first bowl of judgment is Revelation 16, 2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. So there's people who have rejected who Jesus is and they literally have a mark somewhere on them called the mark of the beast. Is the COVID vaccine the mark of the beast? No. Just letting you know, in case you were wondering that, that's not how that works. But there is a literal mark that's present and the people who have that mark now are experiencing sores that are coming upon them. And in verse three, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. So at one point it was a third of things, but as it's getting worse and worse now, all sea life is completely obliterated. The next one, the uh, third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, just are you a holy one who is and who was for you brought these judgments for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar singing, yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. And that's so important for us to recognize that when Jesus chastises people for their unbelief, when Jesus gives punishment for those who've martyred believers and killed prophets, he is being just in that response. We serve a just king. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and it was allowed to scorch the people with fire and they were scorched by the fierce heat and they, cur they cursed his name, cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. Now, I'm, I'm going to pause here for a moment because what's, what's curious in this is you notice that there are people that are both believers and there are people that are unbelievers in this, this period of time. Are you catching this? People who have the mark of a saint and people who have the mark of the beast. Now, depending on what your viewpoint is on the tribulation, you may be wondering what happens if every single person who's a believer gets raptured before the tribulation? How are there still believers? And I think it's a very, very fair, fair question. There are people that during these last days are going to start to put these pieces together and go, wow, the scriptures are true. What's happening is real. I need to bow my knee to Jesus. And in fact, every one of these different bowls that are poured out, they are hoping, or the goal of them is to get people to repent of what they've done. But you can see from this last one right here, they did not repent and give him glory. So there's an intensifying of the sun's heat. You thought it was hot this summer. Just get ready for what it's going to be like in the end. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and the kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. Again, no repentance and there is darkness and intensification of sores that are present. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Pausing on verse 13 for a moment. Did you catch that trinity of evil? There are three different entities there. There is the dragon, there is the beast, and there is the false prophet. In the same manner that there's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is a very similar pattern to that for the devil himself who is going to be present on earth during that time. There is an unclean spirit like frogs, verse 14, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who will go ab abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of of God the Almighty, also known as the Battle of Armageddon. And so all of these things have taken place. You have the, the seals, you have the trumpets, now you have the bowls, and the final one is about to be dumped, which is going to kick off the final battle that will take place. Verse 15 through 21. 
Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, thunder, and great earthquakes such that there has never been seen since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts. The cities of the nations fell and God remembered Babylon the great uh, to make her drain the cup of wine of the fury of his wrath and every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. A great hailstone about 100 pounds each. That's a big hailstone, fell from heaven on people and they cursed God for the plagues of the hail because the plagues were so severe. Now, in all of these, and that was a lot, just go ahead and just go for a second. You guys just made it through 12 chapters right there. Let's try to piece this together because in all of that stuff, there is tremendous application that can be found. I will give you what my thoughts are on this timeline. I'm pretty confident in them. Feel free to disagree. You can be wrong. So there are seven seals. There are seven trumpets. There are seven bowls. If you notice, there's a rhythm of them for the first six, and the seventh one is silence for the seals. And in the next one, there's, there's six of them, and then there's a seventh one that is a giant earthquake. And then for the, the bowls, there's six of them, and the seventh one is a giant earthquake. And if you look at how all of this tends to take place and how it all kind of navigates together, what it appears like is there's the six seals, and then starts the six trumpets, and then starts the six bowls, and then there is a triumphant seal trumpet bowl moment that happens where heaven is silenced for 30 minutes and literally hell breaks out on earth as the battle of Armageddon kicks off. And that right there is what takes place during those tribulation moments. Now, here's the big question. Because we could debate about this. We could say, like, what are the locusts? Is that a helicopter? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. We could say, what are these horsemen? Are, are, is, is, the, is the horseman alive right now? Was, was Hitler actually that person? And I could say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't fully know. And we could guess, and you could spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what these seven years are going to be like. Isn't that crazy that people spend more time than the actual event's going to take place? Like that just boggles my mind. So, so what's the application out of this? And I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team back up because I think there is tremendous application that can be found in this. Because when all of these events take place, I mean, think about it. If you were watching the news right now and you started to see all of these things happen, and let's say you don't know who Jesus is, and you start to hear the, the heat waves, you start to see things about the economy you start to see world leaders and wars and all of these things happening. It's going to make you have a question like this. What is this world coming to? Any of y'all ever said that? I know I have. But the purpose of these events is not to say, what is this world coming to? The correct question is, who is this world coming to? Because we know what's going to happen in the end. We know in the end that Jesus is victorious. Jesus is the one who wins. The battle of Armageddon is not up for debate. We know who the king of kings is. So the question is not what is happening and, and what is coming, but who is coming. You see, 1 John talks about the Antichrist. Same author of the book of Revelation, the book of 1 John. And he actually says that there, there's an Antichrist that's coming, but there's already been many Antichrists before. There are people that are absolutely evil that have led in this world and that are evil and are leading today. But there is going to come a time when the ultimate Antichrist takes his place. And there's going to be no longer the ability to vote and choose. I don't know what the full picture is going to look like for how he gets into a spot, but there's going to be world domination that happens. And not only is there world domination that's taking place, it literally says there's either going to be a, a mark of 666 on your wrist or on your forehead that you have to use to literally buy things. 
20 years ago, that would seem ridiculous. You can see that being a little bit more true now. Are we there yet? I don't think so, but I think we're getting close. But what all of these things are doing is it makes you wonder when these attacks come your way, what do I do next? What what, what do I do now? What what, what do I do when this happens? What do I do when that happens? That's what the world is trying to do is figure out what they're supposed to do next. And, And the Bible is not implicitly clear on exactly what you should do in every single situation. Like there's certain things like stay with your wife, don't leave her. Like that's pretty simple. But there's other things that are much more difficult and you wonder, what should we do? What should we do? What should we do? The book of the Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation helps point us away from the question of what should we do and who should we be going after? Because at the end of the day, Jesus is the one who's king. He is the one who is supreme. And he is the one who's gonna be victorious. So if you're trying to take this book and figure out every single answer on what the timeline of the book of Revelation is, I believe that you're wasting your time. Because again, I believe that if Jesus wanted you to know every single step of that process in exact order, he would have told you that. I believe there's just enough mystery in the gospel to make us lean a little bit more on him. So I I don't know what your tribulation is right now. And please let me be clear, the tribulation and your personal tribulation, there's a big difference between them. But all of us have difficulties. All of us have struggles. All of us have things that we're trying to work through. And if we could extract this principle from here that we should not be trying to necessarily just fix it but rather let God be God and lean into who he is. Because he is the ultimate one who brings that full healing. Remember I told you at the beginning that you're in the uh, doctor's office and you know that there's a solution to whatever the problem you have is. Um, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody who's getting radiation treatment before. Um, Cancer is a horrendous thing. I've seen many people go through radiation treatment before and what happens with radiation is you get your first dose you usually do pretty good then you get your second dose which actually is not that much more intense than the first one it's just that when you put them both together it ends up intensifying itself and then when you add a third one now you have the weight of three of them and then four of them and then five of them and a six of them and as the weight of sin and this earth and destruction compound themselves like they did in the timeline of these seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, you get closer to that breakthrough moment. And just like with the doctor where he says, cancer free, there's going to be a day where Jesus says, you are now sin free. You are now home. You are now whole. And for me, that is a tremendous encouragement. I want to ask if you'd stand to your feet this morning. Most likely, I'm just going to go out on a hunch right now. There's probably very few people in this room that memorize that entire thing. Maybe I'm wrong and like you just, like you got it. This is your thing. You're like all 21 of them in order. I got it. On lock. I'm good to go. For most of us, that's probably not the reality. The information is not as important. It is important, but the application is so much more important. Jesus wants to use this book to transform how you live today. So whatever your battles are, whatever your wrestles are, however this world is chaining you down, know that there is freedom in Christ that chains are broken in who Jesus is. I would encourage you to give him some praise for what he is going to do in your life. Because this world is not your answer. Jesus is your answer. Can you worship him this morning and give him the praise he deserves?